Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. You know I've spent over four decades working in the game of hockey, fortunate enough to meet some of the legends of the game, saw them come into the league, watch them shine in the game, and now they've moved on to life after the game. The 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast gives us a chance to catch up, tell some great stories, relive some great memories, and hear what they're up to today. You're in for a treat today. Today's legend, a goaltender who began and ended his career in his hometown, Calgary, had stints in Detroit, San Jose, Florida, during his 20 years in the NHL. A uh, couple of Stanley Cups, including the Conn Smythe as the most valuable player in the 1997 playoffs. And now member of the 2023 class of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Pleased to welcome Mike Vernon. Mike, great to catch up with you. Congratulations yeah. on your induction to the Hall of Fame, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gino. It's, uh, it's been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> it has been a while. I think the last time you and I, uh, from a hockey standpoint, I was I was talking to you on the ice after you'd won the Con Smythe, which was a, an amazing, amazing moment. Tell us something we should point out to our audience is part of being inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame is you don't know what's coming. There's no warning and there's no <laughs> leaks. You end up you you could be anywhere, and we've heard stories about guys on the golf course, guys working out. Uh, I was having a conversation with Pierre Turgeon, and he said he was lifting weights and kept hitting ignore on his phone when the hall was trying to call him <laughs> and tell him to, to be there. What was the call like for you? Well, I was I had just uh, taken my car in to get tuned up and things like that, and I I just walked home and I was just sitting at the house and. Uh, I was on my computer and I, I see a call come up and uh, I don't recognize the number. It's a four, four, one, six number, but it said conference call below it. And I'm like, am I missing a meeting right now? And I said, <laughs> I better just tap this to see. Cause it that didn't seem like, a, you know, one of those, uh, one of those calls from, uh, you know, the past like scam. Uh, scam or Usually it comes up spam and uh, on my likely a spam or type thing. So anyway, I answered it and uh, it was uh, it was Lanny and I uh, I thought he's calling me just to you know do you want to do a golf game or a golf tournament or something along those lines and uh, he he asked me uh, he said is your wife there and I said no she's not she's uh, she's working and things like that and he says well I'm sitting here with Mike Gardner. And uh, you have been selected for the 2023 Hall of Fame. And uh, that was it. I, I think I said, holy shit, a few times. And uh, I, uh, he, caught, he caught me by surprise. There was no doubt. <laughs> That's awesome. So who was your first? I mean, I'm assuming your first phone call is your wife. What were the calls like that you got to make and tell people and share that incredible news with? Well, I, I, we, we are on a family chat. Or, and oh, my children don't live in Calgary and things like that. So, uh, and I know my wife was working. So I just sent out on a family chat and I said, don't tell any of your friends because they're going to, I think I got the call around noon and I said, I'm not, you know, it's going to be released at three o'clock. So don't tell anybody. So I text them and said that to him and then the family chat started going crazy and things like that but uh my next phone call uh well i guess it was my first phone call was glenn hall uh mm. mr mr goldie who uh who coached me for nine years and uh was a big advocate of mine and a big part of my career in helping me and uh, to understand the game and to push myself and uh, to demand more out of myself. Uh, and he was great. And uh, I called him and he, he was funny. Uh, he said about damn time. That <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's, uh, he, he's a great man. And uh, he just, he was very, uh, generous with his words and uh he's just a great guy mike it's amazing when you have a moment like that and, and it sounds to me like you're getting a little bit emotional but it's when you have a moment like that where you kind of just you just really want to sorry about that sorry no problem <laughs> you're a popular guy people are trying to call you it's a little <laughs> early for people to call <laughs> 
it, it's it's off. amazing. <laughs> It's amazing when you have a moment like this because then all of a sudden it calls to mind the people that you really appreciate who helped you to get where you are right now. Did it, did it give you oh, a definitely. moments like that? Well, yeah, of course. It was uh, my mother and father. Um, they were huge influences uh, on me and uh, very supportive of my uh, career. Uh, my mother was my first coach. Uh, and it was called Diaper League. <laughs> I think I was five years old. And uh, so she, you know, even in the stands when she'd watch the game, you didn't really want to sit beside her because she was always making kick saves and things like that. And uh, you'd end up maybe with a couple bruises on your legs. But she was uh, in my whole family. I had three older brothers, a sister. We all played hockey. We, we were uh, all played all different kinds of sports, soccer, baseball. We, we were a sport family and uh, the support that I've got uh, throughout my career and uh, my whole life from my family. And uh, it was, uh, it meant a lot. Yeah. And, and indirectly, your, your three older brothers were a big part of making you what you became. And I say indirectly because <laughs> you, well, you tell the story. Tell us how, how, how you became a goaltender. Well, there was a couple, my dad coached uh, one of my brother's older team. And back in those days, you only had one goaltender uh, for practice. And uh, my dad would always say, like, I need another one. Mike, you got to come out. And I'm always playing, but, you know, my kid, my brothers were five and eight years older than I was. So I'm, in net and these guys were firing pucks at me and things like that so that was uh, and and I for some unknown reason I enjoyed the challenge and I would stand in there and they would fire the puck and you know that's that's just the way it was and that's how you know I I got to love the game and love the position and uh, I always tell people they, they ask me why did you pick goaltender I said well it's the only position you don't leave the ice. You get to play the full 60 minutes. And I love that. And I, when I played, I played baseball and I was a bet catcher and it was the same thing. No one wanted to catch, but when you, when you caught, you played the whole game. I didn't want to sit on the bench. I didn't like that. So that's the reason I became a goaltender. And uh, along the way, I had mentors, I, a f good friend of mine, Bob Sinclair, down in Toronto. And we still stay in touch. He used to, get, he used to give me all this hand-me-down goalie gear. And it was great. And I was, I was like a kid at Christmas every time he did that. And uh, there was one time he gave me a mask. It looked like Jacques Font's mask. And uh, the team I played for was green and white. And uh, what I did was... I, and it was orange. This mask he gave me was orange. And I'm like, go on. Well, this isn't going to work. So I went down to my, my dad was a painter and everything. And he had some paint down there, spray paint. And he gave me this one that was green. And I spray painted this thing green. And I was, we were playing an outdoor game at South Calgary community. And I'm, uh, I really wanted to wear this mask. And it was still a little tacky, but I said, ah, to heck with it. I'm going to wear it anyway. Well, I played the game and I took my mask off. My face was green. <laughs> I looked like uh, the Hulkster for crying out loud. It was, it was, everybody got a good laugh. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, you and I have known each other for, for many, many years. And one of the things I, I picked up from you is you're not always entirely comfortable with the spotlight. You've shone no. in the spotlight, but it's yeah. never been something that you've craved. And something that stood out to me um, during your draft was, we got the sense, and, and I don't think you're shy about saying this, you were kind of hesitant about getting drafted. You ultimately did get drafted by the Flames, but you were kind of hesitant about getting drafted in Calgary because that was your hometown. That's where you knew everybody. It might have Explain to our audience yeah. <laughs> how that whole thing worked out for you. Oh, I was driving back. I, I, I was in my car and, uh, or in my truck. And uh, I'm driving and back then they, you didn't go to the draft or anything like that. So uh, the first time I heard it was uh, Peter Marr gets on the radio and said the Calgary Flames. A legend, uh, a legend of broadcasting for yes, our audience. He, he, he absolutely. Uh, you know, he's unbelievable. Great guy. Yeah, baby. 
Um, anyway, he he got on the radio and just said that uh, the Calgary Flames 56 pick have picked local goaltender Mike Vernon. And I go, darn it. <laughs> I just sat back. I'm like, what? I couldn't believe it. Because I, I had talked to uh, probably about four or six other teams. And I thought I'd, you know, I just... I even talked to Gump Worsley, you know, with Minnesota and things like this and these on the phone radio uh, interviews and things like that. So, you know, playing your whole hockey career in, in Calgary and things like that, I, you know, I just, I, like even in junior, I got a lot of attention and things, but, you know, I just wanted a, a little change of venue and, and to go play, but Saying that, I played about two and a half years in the minors, and uh, then I finally got up with, with Calgary and things like that. But uh, what it what it did do to me was, uh, it 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 pushed me more, uh, yeah. to 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 figure this game out, and that's what it, it it it's a chess match. I I didn't think I was ever going to make the game. I remember one game I. I let in four goals. My goals against was 22.22 uh, that year. And I played four minutes for crying out loud. And I just go, I don't know if I'm going to make the NHL. This yeah. is, this is too tough. And, you know, it just forces you to uh, challenge yourself and, and challenge your will. And uh, I think playing here in Calgary, being a hometown boy, that was an extra push for me to, you know, I needed to do well. I had to do well, I, you know, and all of this stuff. And yes, there's over the years, there has been this love kind of hate type scenario. But in general, it I think it really helped me push my career and push myself to be a better player. It's unbelievable because I still remember, I mean, and, and I'll ask you to tell the story about this. You mentioned briefly the two and a half years it took you to go through. You you, you were spending time in the international that was alive at that point, the IHL. You played in the IHL. You played in the AHL. You, over a period of two and a half years, you, I think you had a total of three NHL starts. Uh, yeah. So there was, I'm sure there must have been times in your mind. So now it's January of 1986. <coughs> the Flames are in horrendous shape. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the team had lost 11 straight games. So now yeah. you've got these memories of, holy crap, last time I was here, things were really, really bad and didn't go well. Now they're putting me in net behind a team that's lost 11 straight, and they're just, they're just throwing me into the dogs is what this is. So then it's the night, January 6th, 1986. Tell our audience what happens that night. Again, remembering this is a team that had just lost 11 straight games. Okay, I don't, I can't recall who we're playing, but was was that the Russian game? Do you know? No, it wasn't the Russian game. That that the was the Vancouver game at the time, which you did shine in. You played against the Soviets, and you had a great game. Which and we gave won them that the invitation. This and was the game that, that you went game. to overtime in. Yeah, we won three two that game, and Badger Bob was the coach, and that Badger was Bob. in the middle of this, but it didn't count in the standings, I yeah. believe. And I think no, it did game, not. And the game you're talking about was was that the Vancouver game? It was. Okay, so that I get called back up. I think I got called up three or four times uh, from Moncton, um, and I go in and thank God I have a short memory and uh, I I I like to forget things quick, and especially goals and uh, bad situations or things that had happened to me. Uh, so it's uh, we're playing Vancouver, and I'm I'm. I, what am I, 22 years old? And, you know, I don't, uh, yeah, I just was happy to get called up again and get an opportunity to play. And uh, we we tied that game. So we broke the 11 game losing streak. And from then on, it just, you know, I got a couple more games and we won a few more games and things like that. And I finished don't, the year. Mike, Mike, don't oh. overplay this, man. You went <laughs> on a streak there. You went for two months. You didn't lose a game. Well, I, yeah, like I said, I that's know, a stark I'm contrast to a guy who got shelled in his debut. <laughs> well, the Calgary Flames, we did have a good team, and it's just it's just amazing uh, timing and uh, and all of that. And you know, I was just at the right time, at the right place, and things like that. And I must admit, Reggie Lemon was the was one of the goaltenders there, and uh, I know that he he had struggled, but Reggie ever since. 
I went to my first training camp. They paired me with Reggie Lumlin because he was a great guy. Yeah. And he was a positive influence and things like that. And even uh, even then, he was a positive influence. And he goes, Bernie, I don't blame you. You keep going. You're you're going to be a good NHL goaltender. And he kept patting me on the back and things like that. And very supportive. So I, I really did appreciate that. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, you get yourself on a roll, right? And you, you just try to you just try to go with it. And uh, I think that's one thing that I was kind of noted for was I could get on a roll for a, a couple months and that's the length of playoffs too. And yeah, if I can you... get myself into a role, I, I, I can hopefully, you know, go well. And uh, I carried that out and we unfortunately lost to Montreal and uh, uh, the Montreal Canadians and Patrick Waugh. Uh, and I guess in game six or something like that. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a great year. I played in three different leagues and it was, uh, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, it was very taxing and very demanding. And, you know, at the end of it, I'm like sitting there going, Oh my God, I'm kind of on a high, but I'm also disappointed we lost, but it was physically so demanding on me and, I'm not a big guy, like only five, seven. And uh, it was, it was a tough grind. It, it took a toll. It took a toll mentally too. And uh, you know, you, it, it's just, it, 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 it really challenges you as a, an individual and uh, you know, and then I just go in and enjoy the summer and I, you got to get back at it again. So it, uh, it was a fun, it was, that was probably one of the, the funnest, the neatest years, because I started in the International League. Wayne Thomas was the coach. Went up, Terry Chris was the coach in Moncton, and then Badger Bob in Calgary. So it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got a lot of air miles that year, and they gave me the air miles. I still think I have them for crying out loud. There were so many. <laughs> That's good. We're in conversation with two-time Stanley Cup champion, now Hockey Hall of Famer, Mike Vernon. Um, that that 86 year i mean the contrast was was unbelievable you went from a guy who played three nhl games over two and a half years to stepping into calgary going on an unbelievable tear and again it's you it's your humility you want to play it down well i got a little bit hot just for clarification to our audience you got incredibly hot uh you 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 became the number one guy you took reggie lemelin's starting role to your point Lemelin was fine with that. You swept Winnipeg, uh, seven-game series wins over the Edmonton Oilers, who at that point were freaking rock stars <laughs> and the Blues. And then you're in the Stanley Cup final, and you're facing this rookie, this kid who comes out of nowhere, Patrick Waugh. And you you talked about what a great what a great experience was to be a part of that. It's interesting because over the years, you and Waugh developed both the rivalry. And a friendship, and, and there, there's a, there's one fun story that stands out to my mind. People are always going to remember Patrick Waugh for all everything that he's done and the Hall of Fame career, one of the greatest of all time, obviously. But there was that moment where he got shelled and gave up those eight goals in Montreal, where mid game he went up and you know said, "That's it, I played my last game here." <laughs> you had an interesting conversation with Patrick about that. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was in the in the morning of that game. I was with the Detroit Red Wings, and uh, and I go to this little breakfast spot across the street from the Forum, and uh, Patrick was there, and he sees me, and he weighs me down, and I'm like, oh no, no, now what? <laughs> what's what's this going to be? <laughs> you know, sort of thing, and yeah. trying to brace myself, and so I sit down, and Patrick was, you know, I, I, I kind of understood Patrick because I, I kind of went through the same thing in Calgary, a uh, little bit of a love hate. You're from the, the city and the media sometimes can get on you and, you know, things just don't go well. And it, it's, it's frustrating and things. And Patrick was, was getting a lot of that. And he was talking about, you know, retiring. And I just looked at him, I go, you're one of the best goalies in the league or ever. <laughs> you can't retire. That's ridiculous. And I said, look at Patrick, I was in the same boat. All you need to do is get traded and get a, a new lease on life. And uh, I don't know if he, I, I haven't heard if he actually recognizes or admits to it, but anyway, that's what kind of happened. And I, 
I, I felt for him when he was in Montreal and they, the, the nine goals that he let in and that, that was, that was ridiculous. And the coach had, should have pulled him and things like that. I, I think it just weared on him. And uh, uh, it was just that time that he had to get a change of venue. And that's when he went up to president Corey and just said, uh, I'm done. Trade me. I think I, he said, all I, these years, I, don't know I had no idea. You were the guy that led to that conversation, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But he, he, he went on, he was a great goaltender. And uh, I mean, in Calgary, we'd always have the New Year's Eve game here with the, the Montreal Canadiens. And we, because Cliff Fletcher was from Montreal and Al, uh, Al Chopper McGinnis, uh, you know, there, there was a great rivalry between Calgary and uh, the Montreal Canadiens and then in 86 and then 89 and things like that. So th there was a really nice rivalry there with uh, one of the, you know, original teams the Montreal Canadiens which was great and then Patrick moves on to Colorado and I'm in with the Red Wings and we all know how that will happen yep. there's a great rivalry uh, established there too so I was uh, you know and those rivalries are fun to be part of I mean they're very intense they're very demanding uh, it, it, it's just a great you, you can't get much higher of a feeling when you're playing great teams like Edmonton Oilers, Montreal Canadian, Colorado, it 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 gets your blood going, and uh, it was it was fun for me because it was a great challenge. I'm up against uh, Patrick Waugh, Grant Fears. These you know, even though I'm not shooting, but I'm competing against them, and that really was a uh, fun for me to to be part of all of that and uh, be caught up into the media and the games and. Uh, the intensity in the games and things like that. So it was, it was fun. And make no mistake. What made it a lot of fun for you was the one particular time. Well, a few times that you came out on top, but the first time 1989, a year for the <coughs> ages, you finished a regular season first in wins, second in goals against <laughs> second in Vesna voting behind Patrick Waugh. <laughs> we'll get to, we'll get to you facing Waugh in a minute, but first, <clears throat> We and we in the media love to to call this, and I'm sure you've heard it too, the save that won the Stanley Cup for the Calgary Flames. <laughs> You're facing the Vancouver Canucks in the opening round. You're in overtime of Game Seven. You're literally one missed puck away, one good shot away from being out of the playoffs entirely in the opening round. But as it turns out, you make this save. You end up winning the cup that year, three rounds later. Could you could you relive that memory of that stop that you made in OT in Game Seven? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I don't know. It was uh, I think you're talking about Stan Schmiel, but yes, he he came down on the left side of me, and again, I don't know where Jamie McCallan was. Again, he was probably at center ice somewhere. <laughs> um, but, uh, he came down and, uh, he, he took a shot at the, the left side of me just over uh, my, my pad. And I, I got my glove on it and things like that. And, uh, it, that was, yeah, that was a big save, but there was other ones that were really big too. Tony Tanty had a, a good one, top shelf one, but I think the best one, if you go back to that game was Petri Skriko. He had a two, they had a two on O. Yeah. And I just got the toe on, a, I reached out and just got the toe. And honest, I think he was just aiming for the middle of the net because he had the whole net to himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if he would have put it over another six inches further, <laughs> it but he didn't. On any, but he didn't. And I got a toe on it and things like that. But uh, that, yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was a great, great fun um I'm glad I ended up on top and we won that game. It was in front of my home fans and uh, in Calgary. I, I recall coming off the ice after and Cliff Fletcher's in the dressing room and he grabs me and he, yeah, yeah, you little <laughs> son of a bitch. And he's given me one of those, but uh, no, yeah, that's like things like that build your confidence. And, uh, and, and it's just another stepping stone. 
uh, I guess, and you, you just build on those great experiences. And I, you know, you, you sit here and uh, I'm trying to get ready for my speech and uh, for the Hall of Fame. And you, 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 there's so many things that people you want to thank you, things you want to do. But, you know, I, I look at my career and I think, you know, you, you look at the foundation and it's tiny, my peewee hockey, bantam hockey, midget hockey. I know I'm not supposed to use those terms anymore, but I had great uh, experiences there playing in uh, championship games and, and building that experience in playoff games and, and building up for that. And that's, uh, and you, you, you never get tired of it. No. And uh, I, the playoff hockey is, uh, you know, it's the best game in the world and the playoff hockey and uh, seven game series and things like this. It's so intense and it, it's so much fun. And uh to be part of that and to, you know, build up for that. And just that moment is uh, quite special as a, as a goaltender and as an athlete. You end up finishing on top of the world. You end up winning the Stanley Cup, your first of two Stanley Cups that time. When, when the moment, like you talked about all the big saves, but when the moment is actually done and it's over and you now realize, holy crap, I'm a Stanley Cup champion. <laughs> Share with me what that's like for you when you won your first cup there. Well, <laughs> hey, like it was unbelievable. If I went out for dinner, people bought me dinners. Uh, you go to the bar, they buy you a drink. They, you know, and my dad always used to say, you're one guy that doesn't need someone to buy <laughs> a, a, a meal or a, a dinner for crying out loud. But uh, people were very generous in the, the city of Calgary and things like that. And very appreciative. They, you know, they got a Stanley Cup and and things. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's just a great feeling internally. Um, and it's it's just, you know, I didn't. I'm not a type of guy that expresses myself a lot and things like that. But just internally, the self gratification. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a fighter and, uh, you know, being only five, seven, uh, a lot of people had doubts and things like that. It just, it just proved to myself that I can, uh, I could actually do it. So a lot of self gratification, I guess. And, uh, I just keep that under wraps and I just, you know, there's going to be another season and you just got to ramp it up. And, you know, there's, there's a saying, uh, you know, the easy parts get getting there, the toughest parts staying in the National Hockey League. So I'm quite proud of uh, my career and the longevity and, and my numbers. So it's, uh, you know, it's just, and what they're doing uh, in November is, uh, is quite special for me and acknowledging uh, what I've done for the, you know, in the game of hockey and, uh, you know, it's just a great feeling. It's it, it's very cool to hear how much this means to you because it clearly means so much to you. And and I think in many ways it kind of, <laughs> you know, the, the journey you took makes it, from what it sounds like you're saying, makes it that much sweeter, you know. And then, then things started to go a little bit south in Calgary. Um, they were a little rough there. And, and then June in 1994, you get dealt to the Red Wings where – Osgood is struggling a little bit at that point. He needs a little bit of help. You got you step in and and you end up carrying a big part of the load. You share the load with him for a part there, but nine years after your first cup, you win another one in Detroit. How important was it for you to to get back? You you mentioned the fact that the hard harder part of getting to the top is staying there. And now nine years later, you're back at the top again. How yeah. important was that for you to get back there? Well, it's to prove to yourself that you can still play in the game, mm. that you're not written off and things like that. But, uh, well, not in know, fairness, not only did you play in the game, you won the con Smythe that year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gino. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that again. <laughs> you know, but you, you know, it was great. My, you know, when I got to Detroit, my first meeting with Chris Osgood, and first thing he said, uh, you know, you can have the number 30. And I go, no, no wow. thanks. I said, you were drafted here. You're a great goaltender. 
that's your number. I'll take 29 and I'm fine with that. And him and I uh, got off to, we, we have a great relationship and we still do to this day. Um, and we were both supportive of each other and we pushed each other. And I think that's why we both had success in Detroit because, you know, you couldn't let your guard down. Um, yeah. And you always had to, it pushed you to be a better goaltender uh, on and off the ice and things like that. And we, we had some great times in Detroit. It, it, it was, we had some great moments and there's one moment <laughs> we're in LA <laughs> Scotty Bowman, we're on the ice, and Scotty, Ernie, awesome. Mike, Still. can I pause you for a second? Do yeah, you realize sure. that every story you have deals with a Hall of Famer, a legend? <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Gumper there said this go. to me in the Glen Hall and Scotty <laughs> Bowman. And yeah, like it's just every single story you have is like a hockey legend. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I didn't want to interrupt. And, and Chris Osgood will be there one day. Yeah. <laughs> but in, anyway, we're he, he looked at both of us. He goes. Who the hell am I going to play tonight? Vernon, you're awful against LA. I said, you're no good against LA either, for Christ's sake. Do I have to call up Kevin Hodson? You know, okay, Ozzy, you're going tonight. Vernon, you have San Jose tomorrow. And I'm like going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've had some great times and uh, good laughs and great stories. And, and that's another thing that gets missed. And I, I guess all of this is. Uh, the the stories the memories the people yeah. that uh, that I've played with over the course of my career and it's like my kids tell me all the time you know you have so many stories and I haven't even heard, we haven't even heard half of them and I said yeah and you won't <laughs> but they they <laughs> we have great we have great stories and fun and it, that's the the one great thing there are great people in hockey the game of hockey and. Uh, you know, there's there's good times and tough times, and you're in the trenches with them, and it it just brings out the best of the individuals throughout uh, your team and everything else like that. So, I you know, very fortunate to play with some great teams and great players uh, in this league, and uh, it, it it's a lot of fun. It it was the best life going. No kidding. I mean that that year when you won the cup with the Red Wings, Iserman, Shanahan, Fedorov, Lidstrom. I mean. Holy crap. You look around that room and you're like, you're, you're never going to forget this moment. You're just never going to oh, forget. Yeah. And they go on and win. How many more after I got out of there? Three more. <laughs> oh yeah. They really missed me. <laughs> hey, come on. You were a part of it. You were that you yeah. won the con smite, which, yeah. which, which brings up another story, another fun story. Do you remember what the guy from the NHL, one of the reps from the NHL said to you? Listen, because there was talk that if you guys win tonight, you may get the con smite. And there's something they wanted you to say into camera if you won the con smite. Do you remember this? No, I don't. Did I go on a, they, didn't they come to you and say, oh, if you, I'm going to Disneyland? Yeah. No, they did not do that because Disneyland oh. stopped sponsoring that one. Oh, so you didn't have to say it? No, it was in Calgary. They grabbed Al McGinnis, me, and I don't know, they're a new and Dyke or somebody else. And they just said, look at you guys, you're in the running for the MVP. So if you do win and you get it, you got to go. I'm going to Disneyland. And it was Al McGinnis, that got the, the conspires. So, yeah, that was that year. I, they didn't do it. That's in hilarious. 97. But you know what, Mike, I ended up so going to Disneyland anyway. <laughs> nice. <laughs> It's been so much fun catching up with you. You want to play five fast facts with me? Oh, sure. Why not? Okay, let's do it because you got you got so many great guys that you played with and stuff. And and I think this will kind of uh, just give me some quick answers. First guys that come to mind when I ask you these questions. Okay, it's time for five fast facts with okay. Hockey Hall of Famer Mike Vernon. Mike, first up, best teammate that you ever played with? Oh gosh, that's look at. There's so many of them. I, I got to say Al McGinnis because we got drafted the same year and uh, we lived beside each other in Calgary and we're still longtime friends. So Al McGinnis. Who was the best coach you ever played for? Uh, oh, Scotty, you're going to hate me for this one. Badger Bob. He was the most positive coach I've ever seen in my life. And we need more of that in the game of hockey. He was a great, what was it saying? It's a great day for hockey. And we used to say a better day for golf. 
Nice. That's a good comeback. I never heard the good the, the comeback on that. Who did you hate playing against the most and why? Oh, there's two guys. Can I say two guys? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Claude Lemieux, because yeah. he always ran the shit out of me and oh, tripped me. And, and, you know, that's understandable, right, Gino? Yep. Oh, it's an easy pick. <laughs> and, and Lucky Luke. Is that guy could be on his butt and still score goals on me. So oh, yeah. <laughs> those are the two guys. <laughs> Lucky Luke Robot. I've had him on the show. He's been he's been he's, he's awesome. He is Great so guy. much fun to talk to. Uh and, and I'm gonna put a caveat in this one. Best NHL city to play in, but you can't say Calgary. Oh, well, Detroit is pretty special. Fair but enough. the old but from a building standpoint, I'd say the old Chicago Stadium. Oh, what a barn. Oh, and when they played the national anthem in there, holy At mackerel. the All Star game during the yeah, Desert Storm, I was standing beside Doug Gilmore at the blue line, and I'm trying to talk to him. I couldn't even hear myself talk to Dougie. It was so loud. That's a Which great is story. awesome. What yeah, event? Unreal. Mind you, it was, it was time to get out of that barn. It was time. <laughs> If yes, you had not become an NHL player, if you had not won two Stanley Cups at the Smythe and you had to have a plan B in your career, what was plan? Where do you think you'd be? Do- what would you have done for a career if you had not been in the NHL? Oh boy, um, probably would have become uh, became a painter like my father, but I really liked real estate, so maybe I would have leaned to towards real estate. Awesome. Uh, before I let you go, um, I think this is really important. It, at the end of your career, while you didn't you didn't want to start your career in Calgary, there was some trepidation about that. You did finish your career in Calgary for the last couple of years, and that was an important time for you from a family oh. standpoint. Tell us about that. Ooh, Gino, you're hitting all the the hard spots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I got the call that I got traded to Calgary, I was I wasn't happy and and things like that. And I called my agent, Larry Kelly, and I'm like, what is going on here? And he goes, I have no idea. Lanny calls me, no, Vernie, we want you back here and things like that. And so we, uh, so I agreed and everything else like that and stayed. And uh, it wasn't the best uh, career move, I would say for myself, but uh, my mom was going through uh, cancer. So it was, uh, I got time with, uh, with my mother. Uh, I, uh, the flames were great about it. I got to leave training camp. We were up in Banff and I got to come back to Calgary. She was in the hospital. I had to deal with the doctors and things like that. And, uh, I had to, had to uh, move her to a hospice mm. and, uh, that was tough. But uh, she's uh, a strong woman. She seemed to miraculously get better. And uh, they had sent her back to the hospital and she had hip surgery. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And then she, they said, you can go home. And I'm like, what is going on? So I got to, uh, she went home on the farm, driving the car, living a good life. And uh, I got to spend another, a good year with her before she passed. So that's that's what I was grateful for. Mike, you're a very, very special. You're a very, very special person. It's been phenomenal catching up with you we so appreciate um your openness to share these stories with us and to just allow us <clears throat> to celebrate with you um what must be an incredibly proud moment for you but much more importantly for your parents who got you here thank you thank you Definitely. so much could not be happier for you and your entire family my friend thank you for sharing this with us Gino, great anytime Thank you. Appreciate that. 
Two-time Stanley Cup champion, Conn Smythe Award winner, and now Hockey Hall of Famer. The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven. Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee. Fresh, 100% premium Arabica coffee, hot from the oven, pizza and wings, pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, a dozen eggs, and a loaf of bread from the 7Now app. And Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. Hey, if you miss any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at overtimepodcast.ca where you can both listen and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, iTunes, Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Until next week, I'm Gino Retta saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast.